του μαύρου του έρευου στην άπειρη μήτρο χωρίς με άλλον ποτέ της να σμίξει το βγό της γεννά η μελανό πέρασε νύχτα και οι ώρες περάσαν προχώρης ο χρόνος και το κέλι πως πάει sun sheds light on a new world, still malleable, not yet having reached its definite form. Through the waves there drifts a rock, floating along, without identity, nameless, undeclared, Adelos. No shadow falls upon the ground, because the rock moves with the sun. It travels in a space without memory beyond history, out of time. Yet there is a point, a certain moment, somewhere in the space-time curve where the rock stops. It escapes the chaos of Lethe and it becomes truth, ah, Lethia. It achieves a position within the world, its own space within the universe, an identity. The rock becomes an island. It stands firm and looks out from the center of the Aegean. It achieves history. Adelos becomes Delos. <laughs> What was a drifting island has become a shelter for Leto, Zeus's secret lover. Now there are shadows. And in the shade of a palm tree, Leto in labor, hugging its sacred trunk, brings to light the two archers, the twin gods, Artemis and Apollo, nature and mind. Artemis is the power and beauty of nature, the virgin goddess hunting in the moonlight. And like a good hunter, she's hardly left any trace on Delos. Apollo is harmony within the world. He fights chaos and disorder, and the darkness that gives rise to underworld forces which threaten the universe. He loves rational thinking, symmetry, harmonious music, and light. And yet, few of the mosaics in Delos depict Apollo. Rather, they celebrate Dionysus, the god of chaotic forces, wild music, inebriation, and passionate eroticism. The androgynous god who wanders in the forests, crowned with vine leaves, 
surrounded by menids and satyrs, eating raw food and flirting openly, incessantly, shamelessly. Delos the androgynous, Delos the hermaphrodite. Here, man's model is not biblical, angelic and sexless, but demonic, inventive, self-sufficient and pleasure-seeking. The Delos fallacies stand as a monument to pleasure. Pleasure that shatters into fragments of pain, pleasure crushed by death, devoid of the blissfulness of immortality, but pleasure as a cure. Both elixir and poison of consummated eroticism, unashamed in its nudity. Pleasure. Crude and brazen. The Delos fallacies mark the boundary between the realm of the divine and the realm of everyday commerce. They stand high on their pedestals, penetrating the sky, bold, arrogant, and persevering, as if in a sexual embrace. Here, Mother Earth raises her phalluses to inseminate the sky. This is the domain of the gods, beyond time and history, immersed in the waveless silence of eternity. The great temple, the sacred buildings, the altars for worship, all face the turbulent sea under the bright sunlight. On one hand, the realm of gods, calm and serene. On the other, agitated, labyrinthine, brimming with intensity and pathos, the city of mortals, the realm of love, the only escape from death. It is love that raises the human city to the level of the gods' domain. So Delos entered history. It went beyond the myth. 
It joined the flow of events and acquired a human population. Across from the city of gods, a city of mortals spread out. People who worship the broad-hipped mother goddesses and the marble harpists ever live here? Did the Minoans, with their narrow waists and their vases decorated with octopus tentacles, ever settle here? Did the ships of Menelaus or Ulysses pass through these open seas on their way back from conquered Troy? The ships kept arriving at the harbors of Delos, carrying not only merchandise, but also news, ideas, and people from most Mediterranean cities with different historical and cultural backgrounds. They all enjoyed Delian life. Their world seemed a small neighborhood circled by the sea that united them, as it still does today. So many people walked through these narrow labyrinthine lanes and climbed the slopes of Mount Kynthus with its strong aroma of thyme and sage. They opened shops, created markets filled with goods from the entire known world. Not only was merchandise gathered to be sold on Delos, but captives too. People rounded up from the whole of the Mediterranean to fill its notorious slave market. Rich merchants and ship owners built two-story mansions around courtyards with elaborate mosaics and shady colonnades. All around the dry stone walls of the houses, some remnants of plaster in the children's room, engraved with a wish or a prayer, the first primitive letters. Here and there a marble column or a stone threshold without a front door, crowned in chamomile and red poppies. And so what was minor becomes major, light matters become weighty issues, Hence, the stone threshold is found worthy, and this world, the poet's small world, becomes great.
One wonders how blinded Oedipus's screams, Hecuba's laments, and Medea's curses must have sounded as they echoed up the slopes of Mount Kynthus. On this stage, before an audience moved to tears, men, gods, and heroes, entangled in the nets of blind fate, succumbed to the tragic consequences of hubris. Is man his own master, or is he at the mercy of blind fate? Is he Antigone, proud, convinced that she is obeying a higher godly ethic? Is he Medea, utterly surrendered to her passions? Or is he Oedipus, victim of a curse haunting his progenitors? Hadrian, inspired by the harmonious spirit of Apollo, traveled from Ephesus to Delos to sit here on a bright autumn morning. Did he see the Bacchae? Did he identify himself with Pentheus, thinking about his destiny, about Antinous, the boy of divine beauty whose statues were to fill the world? from Gibraltar to Mesopotamia, and from the Nile to the coast of the English Channel. Antinous, now a starry constellation, passing above Delos and shedding its pale light onto these marbles. Lower down is the sea and the harbor, with a cedar sailboat ready to carry them away, tragic figures in a drama four centuries after Euripides. Away, somewhere, no matter where. Perhaps to Athens, to Sicily, to Rome, wherever their fate awaits them. This drama has been played for thousands of years. A drama of agony and fear. And our illusion is always that we will escape death. A journey of uncertain duration, but certain in its destination. Σε εσά θα μιλήσουμε, σε εσά που η ζωή σα το σκοτάδι είναι ρηγμένη. Αδύναμε σαν φίλα μαραμένα, χάνουν τη γενιά σα. Κομμάτια από πυλό παραμένα. Ονείρα τι σκιέ, φαντάζεματα εφήμερα. Ο σύστον θνητών το πολύ παθογένο. Ακούστε μα Man is the only being that questions and doubts all the way to the end of the drama, to death. Death that always shatters life, again and again. Here, at the top of Delos, are we at the beginning or at the end of a nostalgic journey? How beautiful life is, how unjust are sleep and death. How magnificent the overcast sky is. How beautiful are the sun and the wine-dark sea. 
one can only dream. Dreaming is the only salvation beyond reality. Below us is the world that emerged from chaos, the island that was born out of nothing, the Adelos Delos. And even if death and sleep are lurking in the wings, the dream accompanies us. And our dream is nothing else than our desire for immortality. It's a reminder of our divine origin. It's our inheritance, along with art, invention, love, freedom. And it's a wish that we can leave behind a trace, a seed of immortality, here, on the peak of Delos. Thank you.